It's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you very much to the conference organizers for um, inviting me. Uh, it's a, an opportunity to interact extensively with the UK and European sectors uh, in a, in a very on a very, very important topic, and that is uh, the use and the multiple use um, of our ocean. Um, I'm actually I've reverted, uh, reversing the, uh, it's not challenges and trends, it's trends and challenges. So, you know, I, and, and there was so much covered in this morning's session that I'm going to skip over a lot of the trends that I had originally in this presentation and just maybe pick out a few that weren't mentioned this morning that I, I still think are um, equally important. Um, and I, I'm going to start off, and by the way, if you want to group around these uh, screens here, they put two more screens in the front, you could see it better, because my slides probably won't show up on, on the screen here. Um, there are, this, this report is from the World Economic Forum, and identifies what are the most important risks that they believe in. Um, and on the vertical axis here is the perceived impact of a risk in billions of dollars. And on the horizontal axis is the perceived, perceived likelihood to occur within the next 10 years. And I've highlighted on the side some of the sort of the high impact uh, and high likely to, very likely to uh, occur events, um, climate change, water security, food security, storms and cyclones, flooding, biodiversity loss, earthquakes and volcanoes, and air pollution. And you realize that a lot of those high impact, very likely risks are associated with what's happening in the ocean and its connection to the rest of our planetary system. Let's take a look now at what the ocean really does provide us, sort of the ecosystem services, the give and the take, so to speak, that we have um, coming from the ocean. And this is a schematic here that tries to illustrate some of the, the major uh, get goods and services that we get for free and also talks about what, uh, tries to illustrate what some of those goods and services are that we actually derive economic and social benefit from. So certainly the ocean is critical in the three major global cycles of, of the planetary system that would be heat, carbon, and water. There's also other global cycles that we do in terms of chemical issues. We've already heard the, about the oxygen production and the 50% of that and the result of uh, every second breath that you take coming from the ocean. We obviously rely on the ocean economically for transportation. Uh, we've uh, obviously, tourism and recreation is another economic uh, take, if you will, from the ocean. Uh, fisheries, food comes from the ocean. Um, the uh, CO2 sequestration, we've heard about it, that the extra carbon dioxide that we're putting into the atmosphere, at least 25% of that will come back into the ocean and be uptake by the ocean, so it's a sequestration component. Um, we have extractive industries in terms of minerals and oil. Uh, it's certainly that that has derived a huge economic benefit um, to society. Um, we've heard about in this last session in particular about the role, at, at, if you will, sort of the new discovery and use and application mode of what we might have in the bio, rich biodiversity in the ocean in terms of the biospectrum, in terms of uh, the micro, I'm going to say algae, I can't do it the other way, algae, algae, does I say it right? <laughs> Um, um, as well as other, the uh, microbial and other content uh, from the biodiversity that's leading us to new products in terms of natural products, uh, pharmaceutical products, uh, biotech. Um, we've even heard most recently, at least in the United States, in the biomedical profession or the biotech profession of looking at the behavior of organisms in, in the ocean and being able to emulate them in terms of new heart pumps heart pumps like the jellyfish, how does it pump? Can you use that in order to look at that? Protozoa, in terms of looking at how you can replicate certain uh, uh, prosthetic devices, et cetera. And of course, we've also used the ocean very much as a dumping ground, a dumping ground for waste. Our waste, our nitrogen, our fertilizer waste, um, pharma, uh, metabolized pharmaceuticals that might enter into the ocean system. New uh, areas that one might be concerned about in the future is the use of nanoparticles. Uh, how are they going to end up in the, uh, in, the, in the ocean? All of these present sort of a, a, a great challenge to this very, very special, precious place that, uh, w that is so important to uh, life on this planet. Um, so uh, I want to just talk a little bit about some trends here that weren't necessarily mentioned um, in the previous talks. We all know that um, atmospheric carbon dioxide is, is increasing. 
um, that humans are causing this um, increase through uh, the use of uh, carbon-based uh, products. Um, but I, I think it's important to constantly remind people that this recent increase in car carbon dioxide is unprecedented. Okay, and this particular chart here at least shows over the last million years with the reconstruction from ice cores of the carbon dioxide and, and the radiative forcing. And you can see very sharply at the end of uh, this graph, it goes back to 20,000 uh, years before present, you can see the sharp, very sharp increase in carbon dioxide here. Strong evidence for human causation. It's the highest level, at least in the last million years. And most importantly, the trend is that it is very rapid. It is rapid compared to what has happened on geological time scales, and that rapidity is what makes it very difficult for ecosystems on the planet and in the ocean to adapt. Because usually, carbon dioxide changes happen much, much slower over a longer period of time, which allows the biosphere to adapt and, uh, accordingly. So it's the challenge in the planetary system is how the ecosystems there are going to adapt over this rapid, very rapid rise of, of carbon dioxide. We already mentioned, of course, uh, the, the heat, and I want to just go through these, a little bit about these three cycles um, of heat, um, uh, heat, carbon, and uh, water. Obviously, the major result of, uh, of this excess heat, of this excess carbon, being uptaken by the ocean, of course, is the heat content. And this graphically shows you what's happened. So over from 1960 to about the present, uh, the change in the total heat content, most of it, 90% probably, approximately, um, is going into the ocean compared to what is being absorbed by the land, atmosphere, and ice. Now, that is a good benefit in many ways because, quite frankly, it's buffering um, the atmosphere and our temperatures, okay, globally um, and regionally as well. But in the, in the long run, this heat capacity is going to actually increase, uh, uh, increase and basically incurring a warming, um, warming ocean. Um, and of course, one of the consequences of this is uh, that we do have uh, a really special place in the Arctic where this warming is really playing out at a very accelerated rate, where you have now less ice and more access to what was relatively a pristine environment before. So the warming. In, it, it has, I don't know if you're probably, you're probably all aware, but just recently, in fact, at least it was last week, that uh, many, many organizations in the U.S., it was the National Snow and Ice Data Center, reported the lowest ice uh, ever recorded um, since satellite monitoring began. A very, very dramatic change. It sets up, obviously, a positive feedback loop by exposing more dark sea surface to solar radiation and hence uh, increasing surface warming. warming. Uh, you may have you've heard earlier today that this sort of what's happening in the Arctic may very well impact, impact weather, particularly in Europe, and early research investigating the implications set, suggests that a massive reduction in sea ice is likely to have an impact on the path um, of the jet stream, uh, which is the high altitude wind patterns that guides weather systems, including storms. Um, the seasonal opening of the northwest and northeast passages of the Arctic obviously is another issue that one contend with because it really is of interest to many of the uh, industries or maritime industries we've been talking about. So the shipping industry, which could definitely cut transit times and fuel costs between Europe and Asia uh, by half or more by having an opened um, architect. Reduced sea ice is also attra attractive to um, uh, extractive industries as well. And we know that Shell will be uh, basically do, begin exploratory drilling in the Chukchi Sea by the end of this season. Um, and so you see basically a very, very strong change um, uh, in sort of the, uh, what's happening in the, in the Arctic. You also see similar changes um, in the Antarctic associated with the warming world. Um, one other sort of trend that wasn't quite mentioned um, this morning, and that is, of course, the recent sea level rise. Um, that has been documented um, in this recent sea level rise. It's not going to be the same everywhere. There are uh, places that where the sea level rise will probably be small, places where it will be much, much larger. There's a lot that goes into measuring the sea level rise. But remember that more than half of the world's largest cities are within 100 kilometers of the ocean. 
and more than 10% of Earth's population will be directly affected by a rise of one meter. Um, this next slide shows that the impact is probably the most dramatic for those in the developing world. So with a one meter rise, Bangladesh, for example, will have three million hectares submerged and about 15 to 20 million people displaced. India, 600,000 hectares, seven million people. Indonesia, 3.4 million hectares, two million people. Vietnam, Nigeria, the Maldives, of course, will be completely submerged. So this presents a really unique challenge in terms of what are we going to do with migrations of human populations from um, areas that have routinely been very, very productive from a socioeconomic view and from a cultural point of view for many of the developing nations. Um, we talked a little bit about seawater here and uh, the uh, other part of uh, uh, climate change or the global warming and the uptake of carbon by the ocean, and that is, of course, that CO2, uh, when it comes and gets dissolved in, CO, uh, in seawater, it forms carbonic acid, which, of course, makes the water more acidic. And basically, you have this simple, simple equation. The chemistry is well known, the biogeochemistry of seawater and, and carbon dioxide. And what this graph shows is the changes in pH as a function of year. And up to the year 2000, we've probably seen a 30% increase in acidity a 16% decrease, of course, in CO2, CO3, 2 minus. And then if the projections or trends were to continue, as business as usual is mentioned by, I believe, um, Wendy, that the acidity could be changed by as much as 150% by the year 2100. So these are very, very significant, um, significant changes. And of course, the impacts or the research or what's interesting, it's going to be, not interesting, but it's going to be problematic, is what happens to the changing food web associated with that. We've already begun to see research that strongly affects the, that strong, that, that this acidification process strongly affects uh, marine organisms. Um, the effects are largely negative. It's true that there are some species, like uh, some uh, species that are photosynthetic organisms, that might do better for a short period of time. But it's clear that many of the calcifying organisms, such as your corals, uh, your, um, your corals, your plankton, your zooplankton, and mollusks, generally do more poorly. Um, early research is also showing that larger behavior or larger organisms such as fish, squid, crustaceans also experience subtle changes in behavior or, or biochemical processes uh, by, because of ocean acidifications. And it's really, really having profound effects, if you will, on their overall life functions. And, and we're learning this basically through uh, using all of the omic tools, the proteomics, the genomics, that basically allow to look at the processes of how these biological organisms are functioning and what um, ocean acidification is doing to this. Um, really, a significant challenge um, is to scale these observed individual responses that we're seeing in these individual organisms up to understanding population or ecosystem scale um, responses to, uh, to the ocean acidification. But clearly, again, another sort of trend that one needs to, to be concerned about. One thing that wasn't quite mentioned is that there are local sources of acidification that, cre that create additional um, impacts. And this diagram tries to uh, uh, illustrate what some of those uh, impact, uh, additional sources of acidification. Um, you basically certainly have fertilizers um, and uh, storm water runoff, point source pollution, erosion, uh, river inputs that come from uh, 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 that are polluted rivers um, into the water. But there's also a very natural occurring um, uh, uh, local source of acidification, and that is upwelling water from the deep ocean. And as upwelling water from the deep ocean occurs, particularly in certain areas where there uh, uh, may be uh, uh, oyster hatcheries, and this is in the United States off the Pacific uh, coast, um, in the U.S. Pacific Northwest, upwelling of deep ocean uh, water occasionally lowers the pH um, in the bays that harbor uh, oyster farms. And in 2007 and 2008, the upwelling created conditions similar to what we can routinely expect to see by the end of this century in our, in our bays and estuaries along our coastal uh, regions. And, uh, to give you an idea, the commercial oyster hatcheries were, are about a $100 million industry off the um, Washington coast and Oregon coast, about 3,000 jobs. Um, and no natural Pacific oyster recruitment has been held in Washington state for the past decade, and there have been many hatchery 
failures. So, so you see, it's not just the carbon dioxide, the big carbon dioxide problem that we have globally. It also has a number, particularly in our coastal areas, where we might be looking at aquaculture and other farming methods. It has an impact. There are other impacts that we need to, to be aware of. One issue, one trend that is relatively new um, and is, I think, probably one of the most critical things that we have not begun to address adequately, and that is the role the ocean plays in the water cycle. Okay, it is clear that most of the water that's going to get up into the atmosphere and come down as fresh water that supplies us is coming from the ocean. This is just a sweet balance here. You see that uh, precipitation over the ocean is about 70% of the total, evaporation is about 83%. Compared to the atmosphere, where 17% is evaporated from, in, uh, from the land and 22% falls down in precipitation. So in reality, the oceans hold about, of course, 96% of the water, 4% on the land, and about 0.001% in the atmosphere. This, this upsetting this balance of the global water cycle is going to create these issues of, of extreme events and changes in water patterns for which we have become, as human, humans, have become very accustomed to. Um, and in fact, if you try to get a, a feeling for what's happening to the water cycle, we know that we have, a, in a warming planet environment, where it's more unstable. Okay, we're more out on the extreme events of the probability scale function. So you've got this, this more instability associated with this, this warmer planet that tends to lead to probably more probability associated with flooding, um, droughts, and other extreme um, events. But when you really have is, is to find a signal, a scientific evidence signal that you're having a changing water cycle, if you only look at what's happening in your rivers, what's happening in your snow, uh, you're only basic, you're seeing a very, very managed water supply. In other words, most of our rivers, most of our snow melt, most of our groundwater, it's managed so heavily right now that it's very, very difficult to pick out what a natural signal is going to be in order to determine the change. Well, if you turn to the ocean, there's just been some very recent look at looking at changing salinity patterns. And on the left of this is the mean sea surface salinity as a function of latitude and longitude. And on the right is the 50-year sea surface salinity trend. Um, over the past 50 years. And basically, what you're seeing here, if you, I mean, the right is a little bit noisier than the left, but if you kind of squint a little bit and look at these, and you're looking at not this screen, but over there, you'll see that the, the fresher areas are getting fresher, and set, set, high salinity areas are getting more saltier. Fresher areas in the ocean are getting fresher, salty areas in the ocean are getting saltier, okay? And so what this is, is probably a good signal, since it's very much coupled to the water cycle, of what might be happening and evidence that we might be seeing a very, very different water cycle. Now keep in mind, well, I'll, I'll end with one thing, but keep in mind that this could very well be governing some of the major, major water producing circulation systems we have, particularly looking at the Indian monsoon, which basically at this point supports fresh water for about 50% of the population on the planet. Um, we have an inc increased extraction, uh, both in terms of oil uh, and gas. Um, it's uh, well, while the United States is below its uh, peak extraction in 2002, it has been gaining a, as a percentage of total domestic production in recent years. That's mostly been uh, in the offshore uh, and often in the deep water. And I think uh, the United States is very, very cognizant of what happens when you work in these very, very harsh environments without. Uh, a lot of knowledge of what uh, the potential environmental consequences can be if there's a, uh, an accident. Um, these are certainly uh, uh, very, very productive um, offshore um, uh, production areas and, pr and probably the two areas that are going to be opening even more are the deep water and the Arctic, okay? And these are two ocean environments which are extremely difficult to work in. Okay, and they are ocean environments for which we know really relatively little about. Okay, so the ability to handle what can happen in the, in the event of an accident is, is uh, very minimal. Um, obviously, we'll hear a little bit more, I think, this after today um, about uh, the rare earth elements and seafloor sediments um, and the mining potential associated with these rare earth elements. Um, and we're, uh, we'll be hearing more about that. The technologies there are getting to the point where they can be done and extracted. Um, and again, it's one of those um, areas that deserves um, uh, uh, 
some some more look at what's happening on what's happening what are the potential consequences keeping in mind that any commercialization of a lot of these things at, at commercial scale may have risks associated with it we talked a little bit about obviously changing habitats habitats so we know overfishing poor fish farming processes practices loss of barrier islands for storm protection and pollution in all forms all of these trends have uh, particularly have changed could effectively impact uh, and change marine habitats, um, often affecting uh, the uh, population dynamics of a species that have evolved physiologically or um, basically the life cycle uh, uh, characteristics to, con uh, to existing conditions may be altered. Um, it also, these changing habitats also open pathways, if you will, for new invasive uh, uh, species to enter into an ecosystem. And there's obviously tremendous potential impacts to biodiversity, food supplies, and other um, ecosystem services. So I want to spend the last part just talking a little bit how these trends, we have these trends, but we also have some of these big challenges and questions that we can answer that uh, where the ocean can be part of the problem and also part of the solution. And I, I put this diagram up to show that you know, I'm, my, my big message is a lot of the action that you're going to take has got to be founded in some really good solid science, okay? And in the ocean, we have not, don't have a, a lot of good ocean science yet. We have good ocean science, but we need more in order to do a lot of this use that we're talking about. So at the core here, I have this understanding of our natural environment, but in order to take the science into action, we have to understand the human interaction with the environment. We have to be able to develop information systems to help plan and manage uh, things like natural hazard mitigation, public health, water resources, energy use, food delivery, waste disposal, land use planning, transportation, all of these sort of very economic areas. And we also have these, this other area of practical actions to live sustainably, whether it's through legislation or economic stimulus, international collaboration, resource planning, um, education, citizen groups all play into this. So this is kind of the suite of what happens when you start putting, if you wanted to put together a real model of how the various dimensions of going from understanding from a, the, our natural world to actually using it sustainably um, might have to go through. So I have posed basically sort of six questions of challenges. First one being how do we manage our growing human footprint um, in the ocean? Uh, and although there are certainly places in the ocean where humans have had a minimal footprint, uh, there are others that uh, basically have a very ex extensive footprint. Um, we've, we know that we've seen the fluxes, and one of the solution, or the flux of invasive species, we've seen habitat, we've seen the global warming. What are we going to be doing it? How do we manage our growing human footprint in the ocean? So obviously this is an area where marine spatial planning has been mentioned um, as a, an opportune a point or opportune tool in order to holistically look at the multiple uses of the ocean and basically balance them out with the risks of those use in the ocean. Um, obviously, we can think about adherence to regulations in terms of clean water and, and disposal point, so, point solution. Uh, the global ocean is a little bit different. You know, the international waters in the global ocean don't really have a voice. Um, I do know that there is one group um, uh, in. Uh, the United States, who's working, trying to internationally to create a seat on the UN Council for a country called Terramar. Um, and Terramar would be that voice for the global ocean that's often um, uh, lost, uh, lost out. I don't know how successful they will be in getting that, uh, getting that voice. Another question, what do we preserve and why? This is a map that, um, you know, it's, in, a, in a way, unlike uh, terrestrial biology, we really can't observe um, our equivalent of the wildebeest herds in the Serengeti. Uh, but we do have our icons. We have our, our whales. We have our dolphins. We have our seals. Uh, the polar bear sometimes is an icon uh, for the ocean as well. But this is a map uh, that shows the very large marine protected areas around the world. Uh, recently, two more were added. In August, uh, New Caledonia announced their intention to establish 540,000. I'm sorry, these are in square miles. I didn't convert them to kilometers. Hopefully you can, <laughs> in the Coral Sea. The Cook Islands also recently unveiled um, a new marine park that is 386,000 square miles and covers half of the nation's uh, sovereign territory. Um, these uh, certainly very large marine protected areas um, are very, very critical. Still, in order to really determine which areas are best to preserve and why, 
and also to figure out how you're going to manage them so that they can do the protection really requires a lot more scientific knowledge than, than what we have right now. So uh, I'd like to turn to just one little example that's been going on in the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution in, uh, in looking at um, how s scientists working with um, governments and, and NGOs can actually answer this question of where, what's the best parts of the ocean to preserve and why should I, why should I do so? Now they focused obviously, they focused on the coral reefs because they, coral reefs are very, very important in, in landscape. They actually occupy less than 1% of the seafloor, but they harbor 25% of ocean life. They're um, worth about $375 billion annually and they provide 25% um, of the fish consumed. And so what happened here is that uh, uh, Ann Cohen, along with the Palau government, um, met and actually, and with support and collaboration from um, NGOs, started a global search for uh, coral reef communities that have adapted in, to live in very extreme environments. So these are looking for those very special coral reef systems that have somehow managed to adapt to extreme uh, conditions. Um, the results thus far um, have gone mostly um, in the Pacific. And uh, this is uh, now working with uh, the Palau government, of, uh, government officials. They've ad identified in the, in the Palau region what were the existing marine protected areas, yet what were three areas where the, if you had a marine protected area, you would actually be protecting um, coral reef systems that were acidification resistant. Okay, so, so what you want to be able to do, so here this is informing, if you will, and letting you know that, well, I may have protected this area over here, but that may not have the best chance of surviving, whereas this area over here may. And so working with the government, we continue to work with that, and Anne has done a great job um, in making that happen. Second, another question, how do we model and forecast biological behavior? If we are going to use things like marine protected areas or marine spatial planning, and we're going to be looking at what this, uh, what this, uh, how things are going to evolve, we need models. And one of the great challenges in the scientific area is the uh, biological, physical behavior and how they do it. This particular map, I don't know if I can go back. Um, basically is um, a forecast of a harmful algal bloom that was mentioned. This is off the, the New England coast, uh, and this is now being used in um, uh, NOAA's uh, operational forecasting for harmful algal blooms. Very critical. How do we meet growing energy demands? You've heard about this a little. You've heard a lot about using uh, wind resources, uh, tidal energy extraction. Keep in mind, though, there is anthropogenic noise associated with these. And uh, the research that shows how uh, fish and mammals and life in the ocean can respond to noise is something that's very critical. There are certain like, bubble curtains that have been used somewhat experimentally to try to do, reduce the, the noise impact on that marine environment. How do we feed a growing population? Getting to nine, ten billion dollars. Uh, this is, of course, the fisheries uh, aspect of here. How do we manage the fisheries um, uh, better than what we have? Um, do we actually, are we actually measuring the right things when we're looking at how well we're doing with fisheries? Um, is it really looking at an ecosystem or is it really looking at fish stock assessment? And are there new tools to do that fish stock assessment? Keep in mind, though, we also obviously are increasing hypoxic zones. I, I want to finish with um, what I think is, is some of the really challenges but opportunities here, and that's for the research sector. Um, it is clear that we need to have expanded uh, research access to the ocean if we're going to do this. Uh, the, in terms of the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, we're investing in a new ship. We're going to retire old ships. Uh, we're investing in uh, new underwater robotics. We're investing in a, a new manned sub submersible. Um, and we're also, also working on, um, on uh, integrating platforms and networks. So the Ocean Observatory Initiative, which is about a $400 million initiative, will be pertaining extensive co two coastal, extensive coastal arrays and four global arrays with extensive instrumentation to making a, taking advantage of all of our platforms, gliders, autonomous underwater vehicles, profilers, uh, buoys, um, et cetera, and or in a network fashion that allows you to have data uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 360 days of the year, minus the maintenance time. There are new sensors that one can use. Uh, uh, this is just a, a little 
shows that this is a, a biolog I call this a little genetics lab in the ocean. It's the environment sample processor that basically is in real time, you, you submerge this in the ocean and in real time it will collect a water sample. It will basically filter it. It will, com uh, it will compare it to known t uh, genetic streams of known toxins um, and then in real time be able to uh, transmit whether you have the cysts for development of a harmful algal bloom or not. Uh, this is obviously is a technology that could be used in the ocean as well as in, in space as well. Extractive industries, we have extractive activities provide a lot of infrastructure possibilities for research monitoring and observations, but we've not used it. We've used it only in terms of the shipping and ships of opportunity. We have not used it in terms of uh, the oil and gas industry and the amount of infrastructure that they have there that one could piggyback on. But another industry that we haven't mentioned is the cable telecommunication industry and the amount of cables that run across um, our oceans and the huge bandwidth opportunities they have in order to connect instrumentation to. Um, informatics was mentioned a little bit. This is another future trend and, and future challenge and opportunity. We're obviously opening up. We have technical capabilities for the internet, the virtual observatories, open data environments, social networks. It's really going to uh, increase the worldwide flow of information and engagement. And these observational capabilities and suites of models um, are going to be really th things that we can engage an entire community on. We have, we already mentioned, how do we put a dollar value on ecosystem services? There was an ocean health index. If you haven't heard about it, um, I encourage you to read it. It came out in Nature. This is a new uh, sort of a effort that tried to take a, a, and put a value on ecosystem services um, instead of just valuing the natural environment, but valuing the ecosystem services they provide. It's a first step. As a scientist, I could put, poke holes in it. Um, but it is an important thing. How do we value, how do we quantify what these ecosystem services provide? And let me end, um, what does all this mean for humanity um, in the long term? Um, I, I'll go back to uh, the, the, the water cycle here. This is a, a capture, if you will, of uh, what has happened or what we know from paleoclimate studies in past civilizations. And in the past, in the 16th, 15th and 16th centuries, uh, paleo records suggest that the Asian monsoon basically slowed down or uh, re was reduced in magnitude over a series of uh, decades. In doing so, that collapsed many ancient civilizations, including the Khmer civilization. If you think now, what would happen if the Asian monsoon were to collapse? That is phenomenal, okay? That would be a phenomenal impact um, on this planet in terms of where humanity is. So I think there are wonder opportunities for oceans of potential um, in this, and I think we'll hear more about that, and I think it has to, and a lot of them will solve some of these problems. In doing so, these solutions must be sure that they are sustainable and don't really exasperate other problems. Thank you very much.